I'd uh, like to introduce our, our next speaker for the afternoon. And uh, joining us from the Air Force Research Lab, AFRL, is Locke Yan. And uh, Locke has been doing a lot of work with the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge uh, experience. So he's going to spend some time talking to us about his experiences with the DARPA Grand Cyber Challenge. So I'll turn it over to you. All right. Everyone can hear me, right? Perfect. Thank you very much. So I just want to thank Sirius for inviting me here, share my story with the Cyber Grand Challenge with you nice folk. Now, I just want to start this story. Uh, always has a beginning, right? Just imagine this. It's 2014. I just graduated with my PhD in 2013, so it's a little a year prior, right? And as the general would say, you can imagine me. I'm in a pink tutu with a wand with little fairy wings flying around. I got ideas up the wazoo, right? Because this is what we do in our PhD studies. You do some problems, and then you identify tons of tons of ideas. And that's what we do. So that was me. And so 2014, a year after I graduated, the program manager of the Cyber Grand Challenge came over, and he said this. He said, you know, we have this cool program. It's called the Cyber Grand Challenge. We're going to have these automated machines kind of compete against each other. They're going to find vulnerabilities. They're going to patch vulnerabilities. This is going to be the future. This is going to be something that you can take part of. Wow, this is pretty cool, right? This idea fairy, I'm getting my fairy dust ready, right? So this is cool. Now, then he said, well, you know, the final event we're not really worried too much about because everything's going to be air gap. They're going to be all these kind of automated machines. We call them cyber reasoning systems. They're going to be competing against each other. Everything's going to be good. But then there's this qualification event, right? This qualification event, we're kind of worried about. We're kind of worried about the integrity of the competition when we have this qualification event. And so this is the problem that he posed. For those of you who don't know, the Cyber Grand Challenge qualification event took place in June of 2015. And this is a notional kind of depiction of what it is. You have us, part of the infrastructure team. We're the referees. We're in the middle. We build the infrastructure. That's what we do. We design everything. Okay? And what we do is we send out these little boxes. We call them challenge sets. These challenge sets are binary, x86 binaries that run on the Cree operating system, a little bit special. Every single one of them has a vulnerability in it. Every single one of them uh, is up to these little machine guys who are distributed all across the world. Anybody can participate, as long as you have a US presence, right? So you can get the cash if you want. And you're supposed to find them, patch them, or find a vulnerability and prove that you found a vulnerability. OK, so in a nutshell, the problem is this. We give them a challenge set. They take it, munch on it a little bit. And then they find either patch the vulnerability that exists find the vulnerability and prove that you can find it by crashing this particular challenge set. Very simple setup. Okay? But remember, these guys or these machines, could be gals, I guess, I don't know, they're distributed all over the place. We have no idea what is in there. So the real problem that he's worried about in terms of competition integrity is, is this a machine or is it some poor graduate student sitting behind a computer monitor, right, hacking away, finding vulnerabilities, and patching them. This is the problem. So once again, this is very, very interesting, right? This is me with my degree and my kind of training and program analysis. So in other words, my training was building this guy, right? And now I have to kind of worry about, wait a minute, you know? Yeah, I've never really thought about that problem, right? So, huh. As any good academic will tell you, right, when you get a problem, you got to model it. You got to kind of distill it down to the basics. So this is kind of what we've distilled it down to. I have two observables I have. One is the, palette, the patch challenge set. The other one is the proof of vulnerability that they submit. These are the only things that they submit. Now remember, they don't have to submit it to you, but if they do, these are the only pieces of information that I can actually process. Now it's just a big giant black box. And I need to determine, is it a person? Or is it a machine? Right? Once again, very, very interesting. So of course, any good you know, kind of researcher, once again, is we say, oh, wow, you know, what are the cool ideas that I have? Let me think of it. Hmm, maybe how I can formulate this problem. 
maybe I can think about things that people can do or machines can do, right? If we can have a separation, ah, there we go, right? That is what I want. That's pretty cool, okay, right? But then, of course, as you do research, because that's one of the things that we're supposed to do, you find, ah, it's already been done, right? And in the academic circles, if it's already been done, even remotely, we don't do it. It's not novel, right? So, of course, me, I said, nah, I don't want to do this anymore, right? No. Of course we want to do something like this. So this is pretty cool. Okay, so this is kind of a notional idea, if you want, of what we want to do in terms of this problem set. Is there the same kind of idea of a captcha except for a challenge set? For a program with vulnerability, which is a captcha, right? So we could differentiate between the humans and the machines. So once again, this is getting really, really interesting, right? And I'm, I'm kind of getting ready, right? This is you know, the fairy part of me. With these great ideas are popping up. Wow, OK? And then, of course, reality hits. As with anything in terms of research, we get these kind of things, which is, oh, well, it's been done. And of course, as you saw earlier today, right? there's an app for that, effectively. If you have captures, there are people who provide services to go and defeat the captures. So if I want to put a captcha in one of these challenge sets, well, it's already known to be defeated. That's not very good, right? I can't really detect things. So wait a minute. You know, if I think back, I got a degree in this thing, right? I got a PhD. I know what the field is. I know what the limitations of machines are in terms of analyzing programs, right? There's this limitation for indirection. If I want to blow up the state space, what do I do? I add in a indirect jump, or I add in an indirect wrench. So only at runtime will you actually know where it goes. Right? So this is something that we know. Yeah, this is good. Right? I'm getting excited. I'm getting confident here. Another one, complex instructions. How many different tools have I actually worked on, have I seen out in the literature that actually supports reasoning on, let's say, floating point instructions? Very little. Right? How many of them support SSE instructions? Maybe very little. So these complex instructions, ah, see, there's another one. This is getting better, right? And then we can think about things like loops and recursions. So if you think about what is the current state of the art, most of the tools that are out there, what they do is they say, I have a loop. I'm going to unroll it 20 times. If I can't really decide anything, uh, that is just, I'm just going to give up, OK? Or they try to find some loop invariants and things like that. But ah. This is something else that I might be able to take advantage of, right? So these are hard problems for machines. Another one, protocols. We know if you look at the protocol reverse engineering, right, a lot of the publications, a lot of the work, what they do is they try their very hardest and their best to identify keywords, right? You've identified the keywords. You can use that as part of your protocol analysis. Then you can use taint analysis and whatever else to you know, kind of follow through. Maybe you want to do some bonding through. Who knows, OK? But there's a limitation here. What if we have a challenge response? If you know it exists, you can actually write a program for that. If you don't know it exists, now you got a reason. Well, is there a challenge response? What if a challenge response involves things that are known to be hard, like a cryptographic hash function? It's a one-way function, right? No way you can reverse it. So what that means now is, yes, there are papers out there that says, if I have an input, I'm going to go and find the different blocks that are for encryption and decryption. I'm going to try to figure that out, right? But it's still a really, it's known to be a hard problem. So now we're set, OK? So now I'm feeling good. Ah, I got the solution. These are the things that we're going to do, all right? But not really. And here's the problem. You know, all these great ideas, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I forgot about this one. There's this thing, you know, this is for uh, the IBM, right, uh, Ravi, right? This is something that people can do, right? Watson can do this too, a lot of other people, maybe not. Okay, I mean, a lot of other machines, maybe not, right? And if, especially if you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, who knows if the turkey, right? When in the world is a turducken, right? Who would think up of something you just shove in? I don't know, okay? So anyways, right, this is also this other problem. But, what I was trying to say is there's this problem here, right? Fundamentally, these are problems that are hard for machines, but unfortunately, they could also be hard for people, OK? So in other words, that separation that we liked, things that are hard for people, I mean, things that people can do, things that machines can do, it's not really that clean, right? 
we happen to be in a space where I have learned, right, through my education, all of the things that machines can't really do and people can't really do very well either. Okay? So, what do you think? Right? Oh, before I ask you the question of what do you think, would you take on this project, I also want to point out that the program manager says they have an RFP out. Right? So they have an RFP that says, you smart people out there, if you want to take on this challenge of ensuring the integrity of the competition, we're going to give you money. Right? We didn't have any takers. So I'm going to have to go and deal with the world's best hackers right, who are in the competitor teams. The world's best minds didn't really want to take on this challenge. And I have just gone through all the things that I knew that I was pretty confident about. Right? Do you think I want to do this? Right? Of course. No way. You got to be crazy if you want to do this. Right? So if I was that fairy, I really quickly just ripped off my wings and just threw it away. Right? So this is a very, very nice lesson. Right? Everything that I've learned in terms of academia and all these kind of great ideas eh, brings you back down to earth. Right? So this is really, really important. <coughs> Although, of course, um, you might not know the program manager. But the program manager for the Cyber Grand Challenge is quite persuasive. Okay? And what he told me was this. He said, you're not the only one doing this. We have a great team. Right? This is a team effort. Right? You're doing one part. They're going to have other methods, other techniques right, to kind of detect these things. So do your best. And you know, everything's going to be fine. Right? So it takes someone with that kind of knowledge, that kind of comfort, and that kind of foresight to say, everything's going to be fine, just do it. All right? So finally, of course, I succumbed to this persuasion. And I said, OK, fine. All right, I'm going to go and do this. So now it's my job to make sure that we have a way of finding out whether or not one of these cyber reasoning systems is a person, or is it really a machine? OK? So ah, yeah, there's this kind of reality here. Right? In reality, most likely, we're probably going to be somewhere in the middle. Right, because people don't really just build things by themselves, they write their tools. Okay. So this is my little segue to kind of think about things a little bit differently. You know, so I've spent you know many years, a uh, few years, trying to look at program analysis techniques, malware, how programs are written, what are the tools and techniques that we can actually use to go and analyze them automatically, manually, whatever it might be. And then because I took on this project, uh, I started going down a rabbit hole of reading psychology papers. Right? And this is fascinating, because cognitive biases are one of the most fascinating things that you can actually look into. Right? They're the things that we subconsciously just kind of click. And so like, I don't know if this will work. We'll see. Right? This is a computer security kind of environment. If I say buffer, many of you might think overflow, right? hopefully. Yeah. But what if I had a program that gave you a choice? I said, fill in the blanks. And it happened to be buffer, and then you come up with overflow. What if there are two different answers? Right? The second answer is overread. Same number of letters. OK. And I can even give you buffer and an over. But you know, this kind of cognitive bias, what are we familiar with? These are the kind of things that we can, might be able to target. Right? Ah, you're familiar with that. Right? And then we also went down to this kind of other rabbit hole of looking at things like Benford's Law. So Benford's law is one of these things that says if I go and ask you to go and kind of select you know, uh, numbers, random numbers, okay, uh, the way that you select them is actually not a normal kind of a distribution. Right? It's not uniform. Okay? Um, so we you know, started looking at things like that. And we know that like, the banking industry uses Benford's law to detect fraud and things like that. So we said, ah, maybe we can use that as well. So this is really cool, right? This kind of weird really hard problem has now led me to look and expand beyond what I normally do. So this is pretty cool. So where did that go? Here's an example of something that we actually did do. Based on this idea of different statistics, right? how one person might select values different from what a computer might do, this is a problem. This is called the Dalfantine, third order Dalfantine, uh, third powers uh, Dalfantine equation. Basically, you have A, B, C, is equal to you know, d, and everything is cubed over there, and you have the sum of it. And it's up to you as a user or as the solving for this challenge set, 
Okay, so the vulnerability is hidden behind this problem, this little riddle, basically. All right, find A, B, C, and D. Okay, so if I was a person, what would I do? Anybody would get, yes, right? And so if you Google it, you're going to get to Wolfram Alpha. I mean, sorry, I mean Math World, okay, from Wolfram. And you're going to get this nice little table, and it's going to give you a list of all the solutions, right? Well, I mean, at least the first, like, 20 or some odd solutions. I gave you the first top four. Okay? Now, I don't know how many of you have noticed that in the previous slide, there is this magical thing called UN32, right? And in UN32, we have overflow, right? So we have overflow. So if I take the same kind of problem set and I encode it into a query for a solver like Z3, I get this crazy answer up there. Now we notice there's a huge difference between what a machine, if you use a solver like Z3, would come up with because of this overflow problem and the answers that we actually get immediately from Google. Right? So here is something that's concrete. Okay? So just to give you a sense, if I add additional constraints, I'm finally able to get to a particular solution that I might actually want. Right? But this requires an additional insight to add these additional constraints. So now, based on this idea, what we can do is I can now architect and build a challenge set which involves hiding a vulnerability behind one of these kind of problems, and then we're good. Right? So this is pretty cool. But from an academic sense, this is not very rewarding at all. Right? You're not going to write a paper out of this. This is what in uh, the euphemism in academia circles is this is engineering. Right? <laughs> but hey. I mean, to me, this is one of kind of like the cool lessons. This is engineering, but man, this is kind of fun and exciting, right? So now let's just look at this other problem here is there are only a certain number of these things I can come up with, right? I mean, come on. So one thing that we do notice, another kind of interesting thing, is there's this kind of weird, uh, I mean, kind of obvious if you think about it, right? Differentiation between a human and machine. I can replicate the machine as much as I want. Okay, and in the space of vulnerability analysis, in terms of solving these things, right, it is as we recall, you know, uh, we can parallelize it as much as we want. Okay, so I can't replicate people. Well, maybe not yet. I don't know. Maybe someone will have figure out what I'm doing that, but I can't. So what this means is that fundamentally, machines are scalable, humans are not. Okay, so the second part of what we actually did takes a look at this particular problem. All right, once again, academics, let's try to distill down what is the nature of a vulnerability. See if we can use that. So for example, everybody's favorite buffer overflow. Okay? In a buffer overflow, what we have is we have a source, which is defined as a buffer, four bytes. Everybody knows this. Right? And then we have this kind of uh, bad programming, as people would say. Right? You did it poorly. You have a count that you're passing in for the receive, which means give me this many number of bytes. Okay, so I'm going to represent that as this kind of red thing. If my input is A, it goes in the buffer, everybody's happy, great. Okay? Now, I have an observation. The observation is that if the count is greater than whatever the size of the buffer is, I have a buffer overflow. This is a very standard definition. Everybody knows this, right? And then I also know that in terms of the qualification event, my point to prove a vulnerability is to crash the binary. So I can put that as an additional observation. right? I prove a vulnerability if I cause a sec fault. Now the question is, how do I cause a sec fault? I cause a sec fault if the return address, for example, is going to be an invalid value. And the function has to return. Right, so these are two constraints. As you can see, what we're doing here is we're building upon the nature of what this vulnerability is in terms of what are all the individual constraints. Okay? So from here, you would say, aha, I can do that. I can overflow it. And basically, we have the constraints of the count is greater than the buffer, plus they have to be an offset right, because of where the return address is. I have to be able to make the return address to be an invalid value. And then finally, the function returns. This is the nature of a buffer overflow. Okay? What this means is if I take a vulnerable program with a buffer overflow, I encode this 
these are my three variables. And I can now generate as many different vulnerabilities or programs all right, with different vulnerabilities, the same exact vulnerability but different characteristics as much as I want. Right? And so the idea here is that if you're a machine and you can solve one of them, you can solve any of them. For a person, if you can solve one of them, you can solve any of them. But it's going to take you a while to disassemble, to look at things. Right? So in other words, there is a disparity between how fast the machines can do it and how fast the humans can do it. So what this really became is this became a, um, oh yeah, so there you can do padding. But what this became is this became a source to source generator, right? Where we take a binary, I mean a channel set, which has the source code for it. We take that, we distill what the nature of the vulnerability is, we write a template for that, and then we generate as many as you want, right? And so now the problem is if you are a machine, here, have fun with it. And you should be able to solve all of them. People, nah, you can do it too, but it just takes you slower, okay? So, I also want to point out that you can do the same thing with other things like protocols, like format strings, right? I don't have to do a percent %s as a C string and with this. I can do a dollar sign s. I can do a lot of different format characters compared with different kind of strings. There are a lot of things that we can do. But the nature of the vulnerability, the difficulty in terms of the reachability of it is exactly the same, okay? So this is kind of uh, what we had in terms of the insight here. And it really kind of evolved from this idea of what can people do versus what can machines do to this kind of final realization. Once again, it's just engineering, right? That people can do it, machines can do it, but there's different speeds, okay? Different things they can do. And if you're interested, um, you can go online to the GitHub page for the CyberGround Challenge. Right? You can go and download the source. You can find all the bugs that are in there because I know there are bugs. I wrote it. Okay? That's pretty obvious. Right? Um, I'm not a developer. Uh, you can go and play around with it right? and just have a little bit of fun. And it's, I just wanted to you know, kind of leave this, which is just this reminder that this, this is kind of like a crazy problem that was given to me. Right? And normally, you have to be crazy to take it on. Uh, but, you know, once again, I got tricked. I took it on, and uh, you, know, it's, you learn a lot. And the most important thing is there's a lot of unknowns in terms of this space. But someone has to do it, right? And the other thing in terms of an important lesson here is it's not just engineering. You really get a deep appreciation of what it actually means to have, to have something work, right? I mean, I could have probably spent another kind of three, four, five years doing another dissertation on this particular problem, right? But I didn't because I can't. This idea of engineering being just, oh, it's nothing, right? Having these solid deadlines that you have to get something working, right? And actually transitioning and make and deploy it. This is a very important lesson. And I would actually challenge you in terms of the people in industry to go into academia, see what they do, right? For people in academia to go into industry and do engineering work, not the standard kind of, let's go into industry and do some kind of research and whatever else, right, for your sabbaticals. You know, this idea of getting a exposure and experience from all of these different kind of walks of life is kind of what I have to do here. And that is very, very rewarding, okay? So in a nutshell, that is pretty much you know, what I did. Right? There are more details, of course, if you want to know. But now is not the time to talk about it. Um, if you want, you know, we can always chat offline. OK. So yep. OK, if there are questions, please uh, come to the mic and ask. Do we have a question? No. Okay. If not, thank you very much. That was informative. I appreciate your time. <laughs>